<laughs> so I'm going to be kind to the translators and read what I've prepared. Um, so we're here today because we share a concern about what's going on in the world and we want to make a contribution towards solving the deep problems that are besetting our communities, our nations and our planet. But where do we start? It can be very hard to tell. With so much conflicting information, how do we judge what is right and what is true? The news cycle and social media combine and they create a huge and very effective distraction machine. And this prevents us very often from asking whose priorities are we responding to? Do the stories that make the headlines in mainstream media really reflect what's important in the world? Who decides what's trending on Twitter and Facebook? Just realising we're being lied to and distracted, though, is not enough. We can't make sense of surface phenomena unless we understand what's happening underneath. And the thing that I want to emphasise, really, is that it's Marxist science that we need. This is the tool that enables us to make sense of the world we're in and to find our perspective. It's Marxism which reveals the underlying laws which underpin capitalist economics and the movement of history. Explains to us where profits come from, how value is created, how class is developed, why they clash. And of course, further developed by Lenin, Marxist science also explains this highest and final stage of capitalist development, which is imperialism. And it was Lenin's work on imperialism which showed us the economic roots of this system and the effects it has on the working class movement in its home territories and around the world. It is becoming clear to many people now that every day the decaying parasitic system of monopoly capitalism, that is imperialism, continues to exist against the will and against the interests of the vast masses of humanity, more people are dying unnecessarily. They are dying from preventable hunger, from preventable disease and preventable wars. They are suffering from preventable poverty and groaning under the burden of economic super-exploitation and authoritarian regimes. The imperialists are constantly providing us with fresh proofs of what they showed us all the way back in World War I that there is no level of human sacrifice they consider too great in pursuit of their aims of total domination and maximum profit. How many Ukrainians have died because NATO was determined to smash Russia? How many Palestinians have died because the USA is determined to hang on to its colonial outpost in the Middle East? As time passes, the contradictions of capitalism get worse and worse. More wealth accumulates into bigger fortunes, and these huge fortunes are held in fewer hands. The inequalities in our society become more obscene and more inescapable, and the machinery of violence and repression required to maintain this unjust order becomes more enormous and unsustainable. While the capitalist imperialist system remains in place, it is always the workers who are expected to pay the price for the failures of capitalist economics. We pay through inflation, which is the theft of our wages and our savings. We pay through austerity, which is the theft of our social wages. We pay through the loss of our pensions, the extension of our working hours, the destruction of our infrastructure and social services. We pay through unemployment, homelessness, hunger, disease and poverty, and we pay through war. And all this suffering comes about because the huge wealth that the working people have produced is held in the hands of a tiny monopolist class that is unable to use the wealth constructively. This contradiction is built into the heart of the capitalist system of production for profit. It cannot be legislated or reformed away. 
It's vital that we understand that the imperialists are not all powerful and their system is not eternal. The time in which the world's masses will inflict a decisive defeat on the forces of imperialism is approaching fast. The imperialists need to silence debate. Their drive to criminalize all dissent is coming from a position of weakness, not strength. As Chairman Mao rightly said, imperialism is a paper tiger. The imperialists may be strong and powerful, but they are not nearly as strong and powerful as they want us to believe. The deepening of the global capitalist economic crisis is driving the imperialists to push down harder on the world's masses, and it is pushing them to provoke more and more war. But in the process, they are creating a rising tide of revolutionary sentiment and activity among the world's peoples. As Karl Marx long ago pointed out, what this system creates above all are its own grave diggers. The founding motivation for the formation of the world anti-imperialist platform was the recognition that we need to coordinate our struggle across national borders. We also need to overcome the theoretical confusion that destroyed the old communist movement, leaving it divided and disconnected from the masses. Despite these problems, Marxist theory and Marxist understanding remain essential to our common struggle. Without the participation and knowledge of skilled and scientifically guided socialists, our chances of liberating ourselves from imperialist exploitation are extremely low, no matter how revolutionary the sentiments of the masses become. The fundamental essence of the world war now raging in Europe and the Middle East and threatening to spread to East Asia is that it pits two great camps against one another. The declining US-led NATO imperialist bloc on the one hand, and the rising forces of independence and anti-imperialist resistance on the other, just as Bruno said earlier. Socialist China, anti-imperialist Russia, and the socialist DPRK form the backbone of these resistance forces, and they are joined by every country that wants to forge its own destiny free from outside interference. A crucial question we have to answer if we want to unify the forces of anti-imperialism is what is imperialism? How do we identify our enemy? Imperialism in the modern era is not a policy of this or that powerful state. It is a global system of highly developed capitalist production in which huge monopolies have developed, concentrating the wealth and dominating the markets of the entire world. In this system, the export of capital for investment in order to reap huge super profits from cheap raw materials and labor in less developed countries has become the main activity of the countries that are home to huge stores of finance capital. In particular, the USA, Britain, France, Germany, Japan. And it's not an accident that those are still the same main powers which were identified by Lenin in 1960 in his book on imperialism. This stage of development brings huge contradictions. It brings blatant parasitism by the West and ruthless suppression of the super exploited peoples in the rest of the world. Its immense inequalities and injustices are so unbearable and so unsustainable that movements for liberation and revolution have become inevitable. Why is it that so many people in the West have fallen for the idea that Russia and China are imperialist powers? Essentially, it is because our rulers, having seen how the masses developed a hatred for imperialism, have learned to manipulate this sentiment and our lack of ignorance, sorry, our lack uh, of knowledge of economic theory, our ignorance of economic theory. They abuse the language of anti-imperialism and manipulate 
and were disgusted with their own abuses. And they say to us, Russia and China are big. They have big militaries. They are aggressive. They are imperialists. When they say they are aggressive, they say this with no evidence, but they repeat it so many times that many people just hear the words and think it must be true. But the strong armies we see today in Russia, which of course was inherited from the Soviet Union, in China and in the DPRK, were built in response to the people's need to defend their socialist gains. They were created for defensive, not aggressive purposes, and their advanced technologies were developed through socialist planning and not through the drive to conquer territories and gain profits from super exploitation. That is why the armed forces in these countries have focused on cheap weapons that are effective in defense, supersonic missiles, drones, air defense systems. There is no justification, either economic or military, for branding Russia and China as inferiors. There is no country in the world where Russian or Chinese military forces operate aggressively without an invitation. There are no Russian or Chinese monopoly corporations that are taking over our lives and dictating to our governments. The Russian and Chinese economies are not living as parasites from investments made abroad. Their workers are not bribed by a cut from such super profits into accepting their rulers' crimes. On the contrary, Russia has angered the West by offering military cooperation to countries in Africa and Latin America that have requested this partnership and assistance, helping to keep imperialist domination at bay. And China has angered the West by offering infrastructure and developmental help, by making loans on easy terms and by sharing technologies instead of monopolizing them. The same people who ask us to believe that the war in Ukraine is a dispute between rival imperialist powers are also pushing the myth that Hamas and Israel are as bad as one another. They want workers to believe that both sides of the war in Palestine are in some way manipulated by the imperialists for their own ends. That Hamas is not part of a legitimate national liberation resistance movement, but a pawn in some great game of inter-imperialist rivalries. The imperialists and their defenders want to stop us from understanding who is really fighting who and why? They want to stop us working out whose side we should be on. They don't want us to understand that humanity's cause will be advanced by a victory for Russia in Ukraine. They don't want us to understand that humanity's cause will be advanced by the liberation of Palestine. They don't want us to see that in both these cases, the defeat of the fascists and their backers will be both a military and an economic blow to the imperialists, and that this is something that will strengthen the cause of the workers everywhere. That is why the World Anti-Imperialist Platform has unequivocally taken the side of Russia and the Donbass against the Ukrainian fascists and their imperialist backers. It is why we have unhesitatingly taken the side of the Palestinian and wider Middle Eastern resistance forces against the Zionist fascists, fascists and their imperialist backers. For the same reason, we will take the side of the DPRK if war that the USA has been pushing for finally breaks out on the Korean Peninsula. And we will take the side of China if the USA succeeds in its relentless provocations towards war over Taiwan. We will work tire tirelessly to educate the masses about the real nature of the imperialist system. And we will do everything possible to help the people to see that real peace will come only through the complete defeat of imperialism. We are committed to working actively for the defeat of all the forces of imperialism wherever they are, for the disruption and disbanding of NATO, we are committed to working actively to combine and strengthen the forces of anti-imperialism all over the world. The objective conditions are ripening fast for a new revolutionary upsurge. There is the real possibility of a wave of critical defeats for the imperialists 
that could shift the balance of forces decisively in favour of the working masses. The subjective force, working class organisation, will be decisive in this coming period. Now is the time to study and to organise as never before. No cooperation with the imperialist war machine, defeat for imperialism's fascist proxies in Ukraine and in Israel.